welcome to all of you to this um, webinar on solutions for youth employment and developing rural areas in relation to the UN decade of family farming. Did you know that Kyrgyzstan is amongst the youngest countries in the world? It is the youngest in Europe and the Central Asia region. The median age is 26 years compared to the world youngest one, Nigeria with 15 years, and interestingly, Monaco with 53 years. However, if we look at the ranking, Kyrgyzstan is only number 83 in the world. So Europe and Central Asia are still compared to the rest of the world, um, relatively older countries. Did you know also that the highest unemployment rate amongst young people in the region is in North Macedonia with more than 45%? I guess you, on the other hand, know that one third of the population in Europe and Central Asia lives in rural areas. So what has this to do with our topic today when speaking about the youth? I think a lot. So let me welcome you once again to this webinar, which is organized by the FEO Regional Office for Europe and Central Asia in the preparation of the upcoming regional conference, which is the main governing body in the region. The conference will take place from the 2nd uh, to the 4th of November 2020, and it's going to be organized online. It will be hosted by the government of uh, Uzbekistan. So this recorded video is uh, considered to be an introduction for the agenda item number 10 um, of the ministerial roundtable, which is taking place on the 2nd November at 10.30. So in case um, you are getting an appetite, having seen this video on the web. It is related also uh, to a background document, which is, um, uh, sorry for this, uh, let's say technology, um, issue or technical issue, ERC slash 20 slash three, which you can find at the regional conference website under meetings, European regional conference. So my name is Raymond Yele and I will be your moderator for today. And I'm really glad to host you for this event. Um, the recent uh, state of food insecurity report shows that in 2019, there are still 760 million people severely undernourished. Globally, so there is really um, danger that we have also further increase of these figures due to the COVID um, crisis. Um, the estimations which we have at the moment are between 80 to 130 million until next year. So we are really very, very far from achieving the sustainable development goal on zero hunger by 2030. On the other hand, um, I think we would all agree, in particular the, the, the panels, but also um, the ministerial um, debate at the ERC that agriculture, fisheries and forestry remains an essential part of many economies of the region. And um, although the poverty in the European region has declined, this trend is um, currently slowing down. So we need really solutions for rural areas in order to give it home to engaged youth, uh, but also to create employment opportunities and a vibrant agriculture sector, which produces healthy food in a sustainable manner. On the other hand, also the COVID crisis showed that the agriculture sector and particularly also smallholder farms are demonstrated resilience. But is this going to continue? I'm happy to discuss this um, key topic today with um, a number of renowned experts, practitioners, and in this case, let me very much welcome first Natalia Bogdanov, professor at the Agriculture Faculty of the University of Belgrade and author of many articles and research work in agriculture and rural development. Let me quote from one of her reports, agriculture and rural development policies represent a key challenge to the integration process of the Western Balkan countries in the European region. I'm also happy to welcome Ramona Dumitroiu, a peasant uh, farmer from Romania and also a member of the European coordination uh, via Campesina 
And um, I think um, a negotiator also of the voluntary guidelines for sustainable food systems and um, a very passionate, uh, let's say, uh, representative um, to, in fact, also uh, promote the UN declaration uh, for the peasants. And let me just um, quote her also in one of her uh, videos, which I've looked at. If a farmer disappears or if the farmers disappear, the question is who is going to feed the world? And I think this is rightly um, a, a key issue. What I'm very happy to welcome is also Elin um, Hofström uh, Kagiran. She's the Secretary General of uh, Rural Youth um, Europe. And um, it's a rural youth um, institution or it's an NGO. Um, who has been already established in 1957 and represents more than 500,000 um, young people in the rural areas. And um, I think um, a key issue what Elin would like to emphasize is that increasing youth in decision making is key in order to really um, allow young people to develop the rural communities in a sustainable way. Let's uh, welcome also basic um, Kolbaya a livestock farmer from uh, Georgia. Um, and we are, we are happy to have you, Basic, um, here on, 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 on the panel. And uh, particularly, I'm very much like uh, also your statement when you said Georgia is a perspective country for smallholders and, and, and farming. So this is something which uh, we definitely um, will further analyze. Um, furthermore, in order to um, have the representations also from the young uh, farmers. I'm happy to welcome Doris uh, Letina, a young farmer from Slovenia and one of the four vice presidents of the European Council uh, of Young Farmers. She said um, that the agriculture sector already suffering from aging is under precedented economic and also social pressure. So it's not just aging, but we have also uh, further issues which need to be addressed. Last but not least, um, of course, very welcome to Kanat uh, Tilekayev, senior researcher um, at the Central Asia University in Kyrgyzstan and author of uh, many articles in rural areas. And uh, I think he was emphasizing um, in one of the recent smallholder studies, uh, which um, he has also done for FAO, that is key to provide more training uh, to farmers, particularly also in sustainable development um, uh, actions. So a warm welcome uh, to all of you in this virtual round table. And I'm looking forward um, in this next 40 to 50 minutes to have a very interesting uh, discussion. But before uh, starting um, our discussion and our debate, Let's look a bit closer in the issues regarding the situation in the rural areas um, in the region. And uh, let's see what Morton is going to tell us uh, with a short video introduction. When I grew up in Denmark in the 1970s and 80s, my grandparents had a small family farm. My parents moved away from rural areas to the city and found jobs there. This is the story of many families in the region. And family farming remains to be the backbone of agriculture in most countries, from the EU countries to Central Asia. Almost one third of the population in Europe and Central Asia live in rural areas, and farm structures are in many countries dominated by small family farms with less than five hectares. This is in particular the situation in the Western Balkans, in Caucasus, and in most countries in Central Asia. Recent FAO country studies in the region found that small family farms face multiple challenges. Smallholders have, a, in general, limited access to finance. They use outdated technology. They have low input quality and low labor skills. Many of the challenges are the same or interrelated with the challenges faced by the rural youth. Also, many of the solutions can be integrated. Rural poverty has been declining over the years, but this trend has recently slowed down. In many countries of the region, the average income of the population is lower in rural than in urban areas, and poverty has a strong gender dimension. In Georgia, around 17% of the urban population was in 2016 below the national poverty line, while the similar figure for 
the rural population was 26 percent. Rural people, especially women, youth and other disadvantaged groups, have fewer decent employment opportunities and do often not have access to adequate living and working conditions. Rural areas offer often only low-skilled and insecure employment. At the same time, agriculture remains an essential part of many economies in the region. In Albania, the share is more than one-third of the total economy. The needs and constraints of smallholders and family farms have been further deepened in the past six months because of the COVID-19 pandemic. The rapid surveys conducted by FAO in the past months showed increasing financial problems for value chain actors and therefore also for smallholders. They have in general the least capacities and resources to cope with the pandemic and it is key to increase their resilience. Small family farms are not one homogeneous group and therefore there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach. This should be considered when we provide policy recommendations for their development. First, there are those small farms that have the potential, the knowledge and also access to the resources, both human and financial, to develop into commercial family farms, the type of farm that is the backbone of the farm structures in most EU member countries. Second, there is the part of the rural population that have the potential and resources to diversify the economy by developing a business not directly in primary agricultural production, but in areas such as processing agriculture, of agricultural products, rural tourism, handicrafts, etc. Finally, there is also a part of the rural population that will often not be able to further develop. This includes the elderly, and the most vulnerable, and they are in danger of being left behind. This group needs to be supported by social protection measures. This said, we should also remember that many rural households have mixed livelihood strategies allowing them to combine income from agriculture with income from outside of the farm. This is part of the problem, but it can certainly also be part of the solution. Not only small farms, but also rural youth in the region face several challenges including high levels of youth unemployment in many countries. In 2017, youth unemployment rate in Armenia was 38% and in Bosnia and Herzegovina it was 34%. Unfortunately, it's often in the best interest of young people to leave rural areas, for example, to access higher quality education. This reduces the human capital in rural areas. In such situation, it then becomes a key issue to make farming and rural areas in general more attractive to young people, as they have a major role to play in the revitalization of rural areas. Integrated and holistic policies are needed. Young people are also the future of family farming, so the two topics are very much related. Furthermore, young people leaving the rural areas temporary not only create problems, but also opportunities when remittances are invested in agriculture or in development of other rural businesses. Young farmers are more open than older farmers to explore opportunities to generate income from different sources and not only from agricultural production. Investment in agriculture and rural development targeting the needs of small family farms and youth is a precondition for more inclusive and sustainable growth. This could include moving away from direct support to farmers towards more focus on investment support. Innovation and digital transformation is relevant to many aspects of support to both family farms and youth, from effective farm advisory services to innovation and improved access to markets. The information needs of farmers are increasing, as farmers must make more complex decisions. Young farmers and young people in rural areas in general have the opportunity to be the carriers of the digital transformation. Family farming, given its multidimensional nature, is essential for achieving several of the sustainable development goals. And a key SDG target is 2.3 on doubling the productivity and income of small-scale food producers. So what does this leave us with? The paper brings forward for discussion nine suggested action points, which are to promote structural transformation of the food and agriculture sector, to prepare national action plans for family farming, to adopt territorial and integrated community development approaches, to share information, knowledge and expertise and facilitate innovations and digital transformation, 
to increase investment support for small family farms and youth entrepreneurship, to provide responsible investment in public infrastructure, digitalization, climate change mitigation and adaptation, and also in social protection, to develop policies in support of rural youth, including access to land and decent employment opportunities, to empower young people to be part of the decision-making processes, and finally to request FAO to continue to assist countries in the region in transformation of rural areas and improving livelihoods with focus on family farmers and rural youth. There are no quick fixes to the challenges facing rural areas, but the UN Decade of Family Farming 2019-2028, with its Global Action Plan, serves as a framework for countries to develop public policies and investments to support family farming, and it provides an excellent opportunity to enhance this support. Thank you very much. So, um, Martin was emphasizing in his introduction um, uh, the importance of digitalization and innovation. And um, he particularly emphasized, um, and, and we would probably all agree, that young farmers will play here an important uh, role. Um, in, in this case, um, I think, Doris, I, I would like to turn to you coming from uh, Slovenia with a beautiful agricultural landscape. Do you, do you think that uh, the young farmers will be a key vehicle to bring digitalization to the rural areas and into agriculture and what needs to be done uh, that this is going to happen? Thank you. Uh, it was already pointed out, but still, of course, young farmers, youth on the rural side and also family farming are the future of sustainable rural development. And we must ensure that rural areas are places where young people can benefit, not just from equal, but also fair opportunities. And I mean here in personal, so, social, educational, also professional development. Uh, and for this, it's really important that we have not just good synergies, but other synergies that are today for young farmers and also for young entrepreneurs. Uh, and we have a lot of different me mechanisms we need. Uh, firstly, of course, access to lifelong education, trainings through different programs. We already have some, but it's, uh, it's known that we need to create uh, some news. Um, peer to peer learning needs to be promoting, promoted uh, also through new technologies. And then we need to develop platforms that will allow young people from all over the world uh, to interact with, other, with others and also with other stakeholders. And then secondly, access to finance. Everything starts and ends with money. So we need targeted investment with supporting activities and we need mandatory and well-funded instruments that are not, not just needed on the farms in the rural areas, but it's crucial that we, we get them. But for further development of family farmers, young farmers, and of course, young entrepreneurs in rural areas. And uh, it's really important, this transparent cooperation between all the stakeholders in, in the agri-food chain. And here, I mean, including farmers. Farmers need to get fair, um, fair price for the, for the product. Uh, of course, easing access to land for young farmers and for family farmers. Um, we have here also different mechanism, but let me just point out maybe land mobility. Sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Maybe let's, uh, when we're coming a bit to the policies, let's bring that one in. I, I first would like to still a bit staying on the, on the issue of um, let's say, what makes it attractive for the young people uh, to come uh, to, to the areas? And um, because we always saying digitalization is an issue which makes it attractive because young people are interested also in, uh, in, in such uh, areas. Let me maybe ask Basic um, here also as, as a young farmer from, from Georgia, um, where probably, um, yeah, you, you can dream from the support which has been given in the European Union probably to young farmers. But do you see uh, that, uh, that digitalization is really something which allows um, farmers to become more attractive or to become that also in, in Georgia, 
uh, farming becomes more attractive? And what do you think really needs to happen uh, to support the agriculture sector? And uh, would you would you actually, I mean, you're young, but would you also recommend your daughter uh, already uh, to uh, engage in agriculture also in the future? Microphone. Hello, my name is Basic. I'm from Georgia. Firstly, I want to say that uh, Georgia has very big perspective because family farming is the work that Georgians essentially do. We have 8,000 of experience of, Georgia, of agriculture, wine, wine making, cheese making. But uh, what we need now is more education, more knowledge, more support from our country and support from international organizations and uh, more popularization to speak with young people that this uh, young farming is very uh, important for country, for world. That's, that's what, uh, that is what I want to do. What would, you, I but, to but basically, would you recommend your daughter to engage in agriculture? Yes, of course, I uh, recommend it because uh, she really has uh, skills for it. Uh, <laughs> that's if if she decides, I will be happy. Because okay, that that that, so that sounds very good. Ellen, uh, Ellen, you as the secretary general of the Rural Youth, uh, you are representing five hundred thousand young people um, in twenty countries. Um, I would assume you are um, at the pulse of the young people uh, in the rural area. So. What do you think needs to happen? Do the young farmers of um, your, let's say, interest groups, do they recommend to the next generation already uh, to engage further in, in, in farming? And how do, do we make sure that rural people are really staying and, uh, or why do rural people leave? So I just want to start off with saying that in 2018, we took part in a, we partnered in a research project run by the uh, Rural Youth Project in Scotland. And uh, one of the findings that were there were about that 50% of the, the young people who answered the, uh, the questions said that they chose to live where they live because of their connections to their families or their partners. While 24% said that they're based on work, choose to live in rural areas. Um, I think that this shows uh, like how important the social structure of it is and how important it is to really help young people to create those social networks and to, to enforce that kind of uh, feeling that you have also in family farming, of course, that's part of it. Um, and, and I think that things that are hindering this is definitely uh, like limited access to infrastructure, be it internet, be it access to affordable housing, or even local transport to be able to move around because we forget that young people before they're allowed to drive a car have a really tough time to get around in the countryside. So these are things that really affect them in, in their choice of uh, moving to the, staying in the countryside, moving to the countryside and even establishing families there because they might not want to inflict the difficulties they have faced on their own families in a sense or their children. So, so these are things that I think um, Community. But, but is, it, Alan, is it only the infrastructure? Because that's been uh, said uh, all over. The European Union has uh, put billions of money into infrastructure in rural areas. Is agriculture really still an attractive profession for young people? I think right. definitely. And I think definitely uh, also from the aspect of, um, of the societal aspect of it. So, so it's a community and being part of that community and also as agricultural youth organizations or, or even rural youth organizations, it's important to be embracing and welcoming for all kinds of people who are interested in that lifestyle. Because um, I think one of the, the biggest barriers is this, that you, you don't have the connections, you don't have the, you don't know anyone who lives in a rural area. And then you wouldn't, even if that would be your dream, you wouldn't get, go there because you don't have the social connection and this is especially important for young people I think in a certain age where you're creating your social network on your own that you need that sort of support so I think that's definitely the basis but the big hindrance of this is is the infrastructure maybe maybe let's ask in this case uh, Natalia um, 
who has analyzed uh, many policies over over the years uh, and uh, in different countries uh, and particularly also the role for smallholders. I, I don't know to what extent, Natalia, we were focusing also on the youth, uh, but of course in the uh, smallholder study, which uh, we, you have done uh, for FAO, there were various instruments also been mentioned. But what I would like to ask you is, do we have a golden bullet a golden bullet in terms of a policy recommendation in order to uh, support uh, the rural areas and to bring the youth uh, closer to the rural areas. Uh, thank you, Raymond. So as uh, Morten already explained uh, about our project on smallholders and family farms in uh, Central Asia region, besides contributing to better understanding of the role and the importance of smallholders and family farms, project has also brought some new insights into their uh, livelihood strategies and in, in resulted in it in that fact in that identifying many recommendations that were developed about three main categories. So there is no golden button, as you asked. Uh, our recommendations were developed about the concept supporting development of commercial farms, diversification and exit path. But if you are asking me personally what it, which of recommended measures is my favorite, then for sure it is the to facilitate structural transformation of smallholders and family farms and support their productivity growth, which is also very uh, closely connected with the uh, with approach targeting those looking for uh, for um, diversification and it fits in what uh, Doris and Ellen uh, also mentioned in their uh, elaboration so uh, my uh, my favorite measure and recommendation out of list of maybe 100 is to uh, to to facilitate the access to the markets but also development of, sh of short food chains and network of different actors surrounding them in uh, uh, in agricultural uh, business so uh, i mean small and micro size and medium size enterprises service providers farmers association social service providers uh, that should be encouraged and supported also by local communities and i hardly believe that there is a huge space for uh, for uh, for better uh, jobs for rural youth that they can find themselves in that uh, ambient let's say not just in a farming and that with uh, some very maybe simple measures like uh, vouchers for providing this kind of services will help them to feel uh, somehow important to to feel better and uh, to uh, to have a let's say better perspective on their future than uh, relying exactly and only on farming activities. Would you, Natalia? Would you would you think that um, there is um, there is a big gap between national and local policy processes? And what 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 do you think? Because uh, I mean, what what you mentioned now is uh, all very well, and it's all all heard. But how are we going to get this at the local level? So are we are we having a gap here? And what needs to be done in order to bridge this gap? Yeah, uh, we, what we found from the country studies uh, that there is insuff insufficient synergy among the policies implemented uh, uh, by various ministries, uh, governmental bodies, and also what is happening in the field. And generally, the, the, the biggest problem is the lack of coherence between policies, uh, objectives, mechanisms, funding, and uh, outcomes uh, of, uh, of policies implemented by government, but also the same is for, uh, for, the, for the local authorities and local governance. So uh, it seems like they do not communicate well between each other. They are doing their best uh, to create a sound and uh, 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 well policies targeting uh, vulnerable rural groups, 
uh, specific uh, 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 farmers in specific subsectors, but still the synergy and uh, between and coherence between the policies implemented from national and subnational level is uh, relatively low. Maybe maybe let in this case I, I want to uh, turn to Ramona um, being in fact an active member of the network of Via Campesina, of course, also a, a peasant um, in Romania. And um, how, how do you see in principle when we are talking about empowerment, because I guess it's a problem of empowerment, which Natalia also mentioned. How do you see our farmers to influence? Do you feel there is enough power? And what I want in principle to ask you, because you are a, a very strong advocate for the um, the UN declaration on the rights of the peasant, do you think it will help? And um, so let's, let's maybe see a bit if we are moving with this declaration um, also further. Thank you very much for the question, uh, Raimund. And uh, I would like to thank also for the to all the speakers who spoke uh, before me. Uh, there is a this is a very rich conversation that I appreciate very much. So uh, there are two distinct questions. How can uh, farmers, uh, especially the small uh, holders, influence public policies in uh, food and agriculture, and how they're actually influencing it. Um, let's, let, Ramona, let's focus, let's focus on how they can, and then can. focus on the on the UN uh, rights for peasants. Absolutely. Because we, Absolutely. Again, how they can do it, we can take up later on again. Well, um, the small scale uh, family farmers come with a lot of opportunities on the table with a lot of strong points. Um, we have uh, practical experience and we also have socially we're part of uh, the uh, part of the society that uh, provide, provides food and also experienced firsthand uh, public policies that worked or that didn't work and uh, we have the vision and we do have uh, proposals on how they can be improved. Um, we have a lot of uh, uh, practical experience of what didn't work and uh, what's important is um, in the process uh, for this experience to be uh, valued by, by the entire society is that uh, we have a transparent, inclusive, accountable uh, decision making process which includes uh, in the uh, in the dialogue and in the entire process, um, the small scale agroecological farmers. This is this has not been happening until now. Um, in the processes where uh, we are included symbolically, our uh, contributions are often ignored, and uh, this is uh, we are lacking a real uh, participation, a real inclusion in the decision making process. Uh, we need a, a real space of articulation. Um, of, of our voices because we are uh, often lacking resources uh, and we're experiencing, especially now, uh, very, very difficult times. Our priorities are in the, in the uh, food production. And uh, for the part of uh, participation, we need a uh, bigger effort from the governments to uh, include us. Will, uh, will UNTROP, um, Ramona, will UNTROP help? Will it help? Well. Uh, the United Nations Declaration for the Rights of Peasants and other people working in rural areas is uh, an instrument that actually started as an initiative from the ground, from the peasant communities from all around the world. It's been negotiated for 17 years in the UN system, and uh, it includes, uh, really it reflects the knowledge and the experience of the small scale of the peasant communities around the world. We believe that in content-wise, um, it's uh, full of solutions and it's full of guidance for how public policies can be shaped, uh, shifting from the direction of trying to satisfy the trade, the needs of trade, the needs of uh, uh, the big multinational corporations who are looking for profit and uh, give a more social orientation to uh, public policies. Because this, and uh, I heard before more than talking about the importance of uh, the social uh, uh, the social importance of uh, public policies, uh, we're, we feel that is lacking and we feel that is being uh, constantly degrading. Uh, and it's really time and COVID, the, this COVID crisis really shows us that it's really time to bring back uh, the human rights, to enhance the human rights of the people. Uh, and uh, yeah, to, to, to give back the, the public policies, uh, the, the social importance and the, uh, yeah, that, that uh, they need to have. And we need... Yeah, Ramona, let me let me in this case, um, because I, I want to stay a bit also with the UNTROP, um, and maybe I want to ask Elin 
uh, I want to ask the young people. So I want to ask also Doris, what, what do you uh, think is the, um, this declaration going to help? Is it going to make the changes? Is it going to influence um, government policies? Elin, what do you think? What do the young people tell? Well, I think in general, what we are lacking at the moment or we realize it's lacking is a lot of research and a lot of actual insight into what rule you think. And uh, I think that any kind of papers and movements in the political and, and uh, policy making areas is, are important, but they also need to be supported by the research. And not only that, but it also needs to be current. Like Ramona said that the, it had taken uh, 17 years to process this paper and that's all fine. But at the same time, that pro paper probably doesn't take into consideration the Corona situation at the moment. So these things need to be updated and continuously worked on. They need to be working papers, not statements. And at the same time, also need, there needs to be a bigger in, in, input into the, yeah, basically the research, because how can you base anything on if you don't know, know what you're, who you're talking for or, or, or the group you're talking about? Well, well taken. Doris, how do you see um, this from your side? Uh, I agree with what was said, uh, but we need to come from the papers to the actions, because one, one side is what is written and the other side only what matters, only what is uh, then on the field is actions. And we need these actions uh, that, uh, our daily life. Yeah, that, that, that is, in, in my views, it's, it's a good um, a key point, um, which allows me, in fact, to uh, turn to Daniar uh, Kensegulov. Uh, Daniar Kensegulov is um, a cattle breeder in, uh, in Kazakhstan, and he has worked since um, 10 years for the agriculture business and in the agriculture sector. And so I would in fact ask you, Daniel, how do you see um, the em empowerment uh, of the farmers and, and what needs to happen um, if you take it particularly from the perspective of a country like Kazakhstan? And uh, Doris just said, Okay, having something on the paper is one thing, but we need to have actions. Uh, so what would, you, what would you say, what are key points from your side? Thank you very much, Raman, for your question. Um, you know, I agree with our colleagues. Uh, Kazakhstan has huge potential in agribusiness development. And based on that fact, uh, 10 years ago, Kazakhstan started to finance different agricultural projects, small scale, medium scale, large scale projects. To, in order to develop the agribusiness in Kazakhstan. So, and uh, one of these projects is our company. So uh, I worked for Kazbif company for several years, and we have actually two farm operations. First is uh, uh, cow cow farm, where we breed uh, purebred uh, cattle. And second is our large feedlot, uh, cattle feedlot operation. So, uh, you know, um, based on the resources that government allocated to support projects like we, so uh, it allows us to not just to develop large farms, but also to help small farmers. For instance, um, we work very closely with small farmers. We don't just purchase uh, uh, cattle from them, but we also help them, train them, uh, uh, different services like vet services, feeding services, or cattle handling, handling techniques. So we uh, cooperate with them very closely and we give them fair price for their cattle and they always have a like market for their cattle, you know? So that's why it's like mutually beneficial cooperation between us. So government is supporting not only big farms, but also small farms. So they can supply uh, cattle for us and we give them the proper fair market price for their cattle. You know, so this is like one example how uh, government is doing real actions, not just uh, on paper, but also to help the small farmers in the regions. Dania, would you, Dania, would you say there is enough investment uh, being put in the agriculture sector? Is there enough public investment? coming into the agriculture sector, or would you say there needs to 
done more? Uh, actually, uh, there is enough investment, public investment in our com country. So government is uh, supporting very good. I mean, it's there are not enough resources, human capital, land resources. So it's just you know, and the, the especially livestock production is becoming more popular for young people in our country because, and you know, on based on that factors like COVID situation all around the world and the shrinkage of the job places in, in, in cities. So many young people are starting to think about the moving back to their home in rural areas in order to help their parents uh, to develop uh, their livestock production because government is supporting. It, it gives financial resources, cheap loans, subsidies and technical assistance. So that's why it's kind of like becoming attractive for small farmers. Would, uh, I, I think that's certainly an interesting point and uh, I would like to turn now in this case to Kanat who has um, analyzed and who has also looked into particularly some of these investments, particularly has looked also closer into what is happening to the remittances, how do remittances contribute to um, uh, Central Asia. We know um, Tajikistan, one third of the remittances um, are part of the GDP. So, Kanat, would you say that rural people um, invest their remittances in agriculture or in other businesses? So, can we really feel there is? Uh, I mean, the COVID situation is a bit more complicated, of course, at the yeah. moment. But um, can we really say there is something happening, and what needs to be done more in order to facilitate that better? Uh, I found uh, interesting that uh, many um, initiatives uh, initiated by the migrants, they uh, invest uh, not in the individual uh, assets remittances. Uh, one of the investments they usually farmers are doing, uh, they try to increase the uh, cattle, uh, number of cattle, for example. So they use uh, livestock as a certain as an asset and uh, it's increased uh, over the years, uh, maybe for the last 15 years, it's increased in 45%. And uh, cattle, livestock, uh, sheep are increasing over time uh, constantly. But also uh, in many areas, I found that uh, they start uh, to replace uh, public investment. Uh, I found uh, the cases where migrants collect money and put uh, clean water uh, try to repay schools, uh, try to put, uh, improve some uh, public facilities. So it's uh, one of the uh, effects which we can observe uh, in many areas in Kyrgyzstan. So you are correctly uh, right. Uh, but uh, definitely it uh, shows uh, the aspects which Elaine in her talk uh, noticed that we have very high underfinance in agriculture in Kyrgyzstan. So uh, the huge uh, underinvestment uh, in uh, all public facilities, roads, uh, schools, hospitals, uh, the huge and even, even an internet access, uh, it's very complicated in remote rural areas. So we need to uh, provide uh, just improve uh, uh, rural life uh, to keep the people uh, in, uh, in their homeland. So uh, I think um, one of the options which uh, farmers uh, want uh, should have uh, on, in place, uh, it's also opportunity to, for, for example, online distance learning and training. Uh, and uh, it's becoming very obvious and very urgent this year with the blockade and quarantine measures uh, across the globe uh, and uh, moving away from the country becoming impossible. People can go to schools can, uh, and in this situation, uh, many, uh, very many rural residents was let's say, blocked, blocked in the home, uh, homeless in the, in the villages. And uh, if they have an opportunity to still uh, get an access to education, to training materials, uh, that would be much better for them. And I, Kara, let's, let's take still a bit on the investment part, because um, mm -hmm. I, I think um, it's, we, you, you said that this is going to happen, but is there also enough uh, done from the private sector in terms of investment, meaning all the banks? Do we have um, here in, in enough engagement into let's say, overall uh, social infrastructure into SMEs, 
Um, or would you say more needs to be done in that sense? Uh, we need uh, to work, for example, uh, to increase access for small uh, farmers because uh, access to credit uh, is uh, more profitable for the service sector, but for the agriculture, it's still, uh, we have very high interest rates in the country. So uh, access to long-term investments still need to be so maybe some special products uh, um, for investments in, uh, in equipment, uh, in some facilities uh, might, be, might be very helpful for the smallholders. And it also may create additional uh, in, uh, employment opportunities for the rural youth there. Let's, let's hear in this case, if EBRD um, is doing enough uh, to invest in that sense. And uh, in this case, I would like to listen to Nadia Petkova, who is the director um, of the regional network on the SME and finance and development of EBRD. So let's listen into her what she says, what uh, EBRD does, and to see if EBRD is uh, in facilitating also this investment. Providing SMEs with financial solutions and know-how is at the heart of the small business initiative of the EBRD. We advise small clients across all sectors, including agribusiness, providing them with local and international expertise to help them build up their capacity and enhance their chances of gaining access to finance. At EBRD, we have adjusted to the new realities and are delivering almost all of our advisory services digitally, increasing their relevance and accessibility by small businesses during the current crisis. Our advisory teams on the ground have delivered over 200 webinars and trainings as a crisis response, reaching over 10,000 participants. We are currently running a number of platforms, bringing small businesses and consultants together and are running online training through our Know-How Academy. Small companies, especially these led by young entrepreneurs or women, have been hit disproportionately during the current crisis, diminishing their ability to access affordable credit. Supply chains have been badly disrupted. Given most businesses rely on network of suppliers, the inability of suppliers to access finance have ripple effect on entire sectors and markets. At EBRD, we work with bigger companies across multiple industries to strengthen their supply chains by providing advice and working capital financing to their suppliers. We're also exploring ways to provide sustainable supply chain financing opportunities to small stakeholders, including in the agribusiness sector. In 2019, EBRD launched its Skills in Business and Youth in Business programs, aiming at advising and financing companies through partner banks led by young entrepreneurs or larger businesses interested in investing in their young workforce by making their companies youth-friendlier places. Said <clears throat> Nadia Petkova, the director of the regional network on SMEs from uh, EBRD. Um, and uh, I think she emphasized also that uh, EBRD is working uh, on youth um, in business uh, programs. In, in this case, um, Natalia and also Kana, let me come to, uh, let's say, the university or the research. Um, actually, uh, Elina said before, when we talked about uh, the declaration on the peasant, more research also needs to be done. Um, over the years, I think we have seen the university education has been improving um, in the region. But what do you think taking uh, particularly these two areas into consideration, young people, as well as also investment, as well as also opportunities. What needs to be done more in terms of research to support this transformation? And what can the academic sector in this case also do? And uh, I, I put you a, a third one. No, I, I let you ask, respond first, and then I will ask you for the one. Uh, Natalia, you want to go first? Yes, okay. So uh, I was uh, very happy to hear from Ellen that there is uh, a lot of uh, re resources uh, and a lot of results from the various surveys about uh, the uh, opinion of uh, younger farmers and youths in rural areas. So for sure, I will search on the internet after this uh, meeting 
to find some references. What I can say about the Balkan countries as well as about the countries we studied within the smallholders and family farm project that there is no enough evidence about the attitudes and about the, uh, the, the expectations of the youth and generally about the rural population, farmers and whatever. So one of the recommendations from the smallholders family farm study was that we need uh, more insights and more applicative scientific projects looking at the behavior aspects and behavior economic of rural youths and, uh, and, uh, and uh, farmers generally. We are always looking just about what uh, the, uh, the policy makers doing, what are uh, their aspirations, whether it fits or not into the EU policy and how and for different aspects of uh, comparative analysis about the budgets, about the measures implemented, thresholds used for this or that measure, and these kind of things. But uh, I am uh, I am very sure, and I think that I well know the uh, the papers published about our region that there is no enough evidence to support policymakers in their decisions in which way they should look and what are the opinions and expectations of the youth. The, the problem is that a Ministry of Sciences and uh, academia generally are driven with a different agenda. They are um, actually our, because I am also the one coming from academia. Our work is not measured and evaluated according to uh, uh, applicative, uh, you know, the results of uh, uh, our job just uh, 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 but according to scientific uh, inputs but uh, generally that is something that uh, really missing and uh, why it is missing just because we do not have enough money and not uh, and also do not have enough capacity to uh, to, to to conduct a well designed and uh, uh, well uh, how to say contextualized uh, uh, field surveys and to assess the results. So that uh, that is uh, what I uh, strongly support uh, um, Ellen's comment that that is something policymakers needs. Can I, can I, would you would you say it's a question of money that uh, we that, that you don't have the money in order to do that research? Uh, because of course I think the interesting part is that the young people sitting in the university, the young farmers are sitting in the university. And then the research is not taking uh, this up what they need to focus. So what what is what is missing uh, in this case? Uh, there are two things. Uh, first of all, uh, I don't know situation in Europe. Uh, I suppose it's different from Kyrgyzstan. Uh, in rural areas, people uh, demonstrate lower education level. Uh, and I talked with many farmers and they found uh, a lot of recommendations which we uh, academics doing. Uh, let's say too sophisticated. They want uh, to be more applicable and to be uh, presented in more simple manner. So they want to be as simple as possible and they always want to know what exactly we should do. So I suppose that uh, we should bring this uh, practical recommendation and bring not only to the, like say some ideas, but maybe to some decisions. They want to know, for example, if uh, I suggest them to, to protect uh, their land, they said, uh, what we can do. And then I need to say, uh, let's in your uh, area, you, should, you can make a zero tillage. They want, then immediately they ask me, what is a zero tillage? How we can know about this? So they want to see, so that this linkage should be provided by from our side. Uh, I mean, for, so we we also should thinking not only about uh, to uh, prepare the knowledge, but also to bring the knowledge in more simple manner to be understandable by the farmer. So you're you're saying in principle that um, there is too much uh, basic and general research and not enough applied uh, science to directly bring it also to the extension services. So that exactly not exactly goes into the yeah, I think this is a transition uh, which is certainly quite important. Let's, I mean, we are uh, proceeding also in terms of the time. Um, what, what I would particularly take up in, in that case of all the problems and the issues now we have also talked, um, we have the Global Action Plan 
of the UN decade on, on family farming. And uh, I think an, an objective of this action plan is in order to really put a spotlight on agricultural farming rural youth. Um, Ramona, you have been contributing also to the preparation of the um, uh, action plan uh, in your capacity as a representative also from La Via Campesina. Do, do you think it's going to give a push um, in the development of the rural areas? Yes, um, we believe that instruments like the UN Decade for Family Farming, the UN Declaration for the Rights of Peasants, the UN Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous People are the best uh, opportunities we have right now to switch into a better direction with, uh, with the process of shaping, shaping public policies in the food and agriculture process. Uh, the fact that we historically confronted uh, with uh, discrimination as uh, small uh, smallholders, um, it really is a, is a problem that has not been properly addressed. Uh, and now the COVID crisis is only aggravating our, our problems and uh, the fact that our uh, human rights are being uh, aggravated, um, are, are being degraded. Uh, and just uh, also to, to, to maybe give more information to, to my fellow uh, young farmers uh, who are part of the discussion, uh, it's very important to use instruments who have been uh, created based on the experience from the ground, because oftentimes public policies are created by people who are disconnected from the reality. So when we have uh, such an instrument that uh, builds on uh, on the experience of um, peasant communities, uh, it's very important to look at it properly and to try to use uh, to use it as best as uh, possible in our context. And I think it's very timely to speak about human rights in public policies because this uh, this crisis is showing the ugly face of uh, you know the, how how the priorities were uh, established until now in public policies. We spoke too much about the need to satisfy uh, trade the. To, to satisfy the needs of trade, and we forgot about the people. We certainly left behind the smallholders, the small uh, family farmers, and it's really time to uh, to come back to them, to look at them, and to uh, you were speaking just before about uh, investments. It's very important to speak about responsible investments. Uh, historically, the financial uh, players, the financial institutions like banks. Uh, certainly the European Bank for the Reconstruction and Development participated in a very negative way in, in the process, supporting uh, irresponsible investments that destroyed local markets, especially in, uh, in Eastern Europe. Um, so it's time to prioritize, uh, to reprioritize, uh, um, you know, the criteria that we're basing uh, uh, public policy processes. We need to prioritize local markets, we need to prioritize human rights, we need to prioritize the young people to not take away anymore uh, the opportunities from the young people in rural areas by allowing wild investments that are grabbing our land, that are grabbing our resources and that are grabbing the uh, opportunities for the future. So uh, we are here, we are part of the conversation because we have uh, partners like uh, institutional partners like FAO that we appreciate uh, very much for their openness and for their understanding uh, you know, of the reality. And uh, we are ready to contribute. We need our governments to be more open and to, uh, you know, to make an effort towards uh, us because we felt uh, really that uh, this is lacking. And public policies uh, ad that are addressing um, young, uh, the young generation of farmers only through pilot projects is no longer enough. It needs to change. We need a systemic and systematic approach. And uh, yes, and we do have uh, uh, all the, the, the elements to, to convince them. Elin and, and Doris, um, I have to ask you, but also basic, um, you heard now also Ramona, I mean, Ramona is also a farmer, so it, it, she's, uh, of course, she speaks from the experience, but, and, and you said before, we need action. Now, it's called a global action plan. Is there enough action in this action plan for the UN Decade of Family Farming from your perspective? Elin, you want to go first, then Doris, and basic, I'm asking, I'm asking you as well. I think that I mean it's a good it's a good initiative, of course, but it's always a question of implementation. And thank you so much for Ramona for saying this because I think uh, also what this study showed that I talked about previously is that only thirteen percent of young people feel that they have a say in the future of their community. That means that young people are not brought to the discussion about their own lives. They're not brought to, to the discussions about their own futures, and and they need to be part of the, the discussions about the the how their life is going to look and that goes 
I think not only in rural areas, but in general, but, but spe specifically in rural areas where, where the distances are far and where it's difficult to, to participate, it needs to be facilitated so that the young people are able to participate into decision-making about their realities. And we have suggested uh, with Sija and uh, Mijark, uh, which is a Catholic agricultural youth organization, uh, we have made a manifest for the 2019 European elections. And we, within this manifest, we suggested that uh, we involve the NGO sector more. So uh, get the NGOs, uh, rural youth NGOs involved on local, national and international level. Uh, then to facilitate international cooperation, because as Ramona really pointed out, I think this is a key to uh, build the capacity of young people in rural areas. And yeah, to increase, increase the studies and statistics, of course, to be able to show that uh, the impact of, of these kind of measures as well. Doris, is there enough action? Uh, it's not. I'm supporting everything that was said before. We need to provide instruments and measures, of course, uh, with which need to engage and support all the youth and farmers and, of course, family farmers in rural areas. We need to make sure that no one is left behind here. Um, and by we, I mean we all, because we are rural areas, we have a power um, to co-create rural areas in which we want to live in which we can have decent life. Basic, is the, is the Global Action Plan something where you would say it helps? I mean, you said at the beginning, Georgia is a great place to do um, agriculture, smallholding, because you have also great product. Is the Global Action Plan something which you need? Or maybe you would say it's developing in any, in any case? The microphone, Basic, the microphone, yeah. Yes, uh, my recommendation uh, in uh, Young farmers is more uh, education, more knowledge, more information, and work hard and uh, smart. <laughs> I, I would say. So you're you're saying they need to work hard and smart. Uh, the, 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 the this is the, this is the way. <laughs> yeah. The declaration will be facilitating this process. Maybe based on what you said. Uh, maybe we need a Friday for future for um, youth and rural um, development. So we, we need to come to the point where uh, young people from school go every Friday and demonstrate for rural areas as they do it for climate change. Very good. Um, thank you for, um, for this one. I think um, looking, looking at the, the time, we are, um, we are, over, we are over time. So lots of points have been put on, on the table. I think we had a, a, a very rich discussion. Um, I appreciated um, the different inputs uh, from all of you. I think lots of thoughts uh, for our member countries, because let's remember this discussion is in fact the initiating of the debate of the members at the regional conference, the members, uh, the observers, some of you, I, I think Ramona is going to participate also uh, from the CSO's point of view. So we are discussing at the regional conference also the priorities for the region and supporting smallholders and family farmers is a key priority. And one of the three really regional initiatives, FEO is going to continue uh, to give an emphasis uh, for that. Um, the suggestions and uh, the contributions also from here, uh, which are very important uh, also to further take into consideration. So we are very keen on, based on uh, our debate today, to hear from the policymakers at the regional conference further actions and recommendations, um, the private sector, the civil society, what they uh, will put in place, and uh, I think to be continued. So. Thank you for all of you.